established in 2011 by Jim Wilson, who has joined us today. So many thanks for your generosity. The purpose of the program is to bring leading experts in the fields of law and business to our school. Jim Liston is a graduate of the class of 1975. He served as counsel to law firms in both Canada and the UK. He has extensive experience as an advisor to business in Canada and internationally, and was the chair of Cadillac Therapy Corporation. Jim has advised the Federal Department of Finance on reform and restructurings in the financial services sector. He's a committed alumnus, keen to make a difference to his alma mater, and he does. He's also a friend of this year's visitor, Mr. Peter Day. Peter Day is the chair of Paradigm Capital and a graduate of our class of 1966. He was formerly a partner at Ilsler Hoskin and Harcourt. He specializes in corporate governance and mergers and acquisitions. His career, which you will undoubtedly hear more about, has included stints as chair of Morgan Stanley of the Toronto Stock Exchange Committee on Corporate Governance in Canada and many other chairs. I'm going to highlight a few of them. But as I was putting together my notes, I thought, how many times can I say the word chair in one paragraph? He's chaired the Ontario Securities Commission and served as Canada's representative to the OEC task force that developed the OECD principles of corporate governance. He advises all manner of corporate boards and institutional actors in Canada and abroad. For those of you with a penchant for good theatre, you can find him as a director of the Soul Pepper Theatre Company in Toronto. I've come to know Peter a little as a result of his induction into our Bertha Wilson Honor Society, a society that recognizes extraordinary alumni. In my brief time with him, I have come to adore him. You will no doubt find him to be smart, focused, painfully charming, and thoughtful. He's not one to shy away from controversy. Like Jim Listen, he's incredibly loyal and committed to the Weldon tradition. Please enjoy. I can assure you the feeling is very mutual. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, a real honor for me to be here uh, today as the James Lisson uh, Professor in Residence. I'm sorry it's so short because like I'm here today and then we're doing a seminar tomorrow so I, I think it's more like a Jim Lisson drive through but I'm <laughs> there's a bit of irony here. Um, I graduated in 66, Jim, as uh, Kim said, graduated in 74. Um, I guess I was chairman of the articling committee at Oser Hoskin uh, when we were recruiting and uh, we recruited Jim. And uh, Jim joined Oser as a lawyer and uh, went on to have a very successful career. Uh, but now he's kind of turned the tables on me, which, which I welcome. Um, and uh, I flatter myself by saying I was one of a number of mentors uh, to Jim, um, um, but we must have done something right, and congratulations, Jim, and thank you for the support for the law school. Uh, so I'm very happy to uh, return to the law school. When I reflect on some of the experiences I've had, um, uh, many of them relate to my educational experience here and my, uh, the, the network of, of friends that I developed. And uh, there are some people in the audience that uh, Professor Ed Harris, who is one of the most influential figures in my legal education, uh, one of my classmates, uh, Noella Brennan, uh, is here. Uh, so, and there may be others that I'm sorry if I haven't recognized you, but. Uh, it, it gives me a very warm feeling to be back amongst my Dow friends. I asked him, I said, what should I talk about? And uh, she said, well, why don't you talk about, uh, you know, the happy experiences you've had uh, in your career? And if you feel like it, talk about some of the unhappy experiences and maybe, maybe we'll learn something. So I thought, okay, I can talk about the experiences. Um, whether we learn something, uh, I'm not sure about. I came to Dell in 1963. I came as then there was a fellowship offered called the Sir James Dunn Fellowship. And uh, I came in 1963. And there were four of us um, that had the fellowship. And our responsibility was to maintain an A average. And uh, I, I think with a, a bit of pushing from some of my professors, I made it, it, made it through. Um, Sir James, uh, as you may be aware, 
uh, like my mentor, Purdy Crawford, started from very humble be beginnings, uh, Sir James um, from New Brunswick, and then he went on with, uh, and uh, went to Dalhousie Law School, had a uh, Dal degree, and he became one of Canada's foremost uh, financiers, industrialists. He um, controlled companies like Algoma Steel Canada Steamships, and obviously he recognized the uh, law school with the fellowship. Um, I maintained my average, and then with the help of uh, the net, uh, Dean uh, Horace Reed, uh, I got a fellowship to go to Harvard. Um, Dean Reed referred to Harvard as kind of the farm team, and uh, I was very honored to go there. So I'm going to start by my series of stories by telling you one that uh, has uh, had an impact on me to this day, and Noella will remember it. Uh, it happened in first year law. Uh, this was in uh, late 1963, and uh, one of our classmates was from Newfoundland, and he was repeating his year. And uh, he stood up at the end of one of the classes, and he said, my notes are missing. All of my notes for uh, the forthcoming uh, December exams are missing. And the class was concerned, uh, very sympathetic, and how can we help you? And so we came up with this process. We said, we're going to divide our class into groups of three. So A and B will go to C's residence and investigate. A and C will go to B's residence and investigate. And C and B will go to A's residence and investigate. Um, did, did you ever hear, hear this? OK. So, um, so and we had to unleash uh, the uh, bodies immediately so that nobody could tamper with the evidence. And uh, indeed, that process started at about, I would say, late morning. And by 2 p.m., the notes had been discovered in one of uh, our classmates' <coughs> studies. And uh, he disappeared from law school that day and <coughs> never to be seen again. Um, so you. We had not taken constitutional law at that point in time. <laughs> so we didn't have a good sense of, of process, uh, fairness. Um, but it was, it was an amazing process when I reflect back on it. And I think we were naive. Uh, we didn't, um, we sort of thought, uh, and I, I guess the learning from this is that um, the result does not necessarily justify the process. I think if you had to look at that process in the sort of uh, clear light of day, you would say, you know, um, I'm not sure I'm willing to have uh, strangers unauthorized coming in and looking through my uh, notes. Anyway, it, it worked, and uh, our classmate Frank went on to uh, graduate and become a very successful lawyer. Uh, in my third year law, I had the opportunity to go to uh, Toronto and attend a, a conference, and one of the panelists was Purdy Crawford, and uh, we were obviously drawn to each other because of our Dell connection, and he invited me to apply for an articling position at uh, Osler, um, at, which I did after uh, I went on to Harvard, and when I was there, I came back in the fall. Uh, applied to six firms, and uh, um, I, I, I had a series of offers, and I, I didn't know how I would, I, I didn't know much about Toronto law firms, uh, how, how am I going to choose? So, um, but Purdy solved it for me. He said, I'm going to give you credit for your LLM, and uh, uh, you're going to get $100 more a month. <laughs> and that was big, big stuff. Um, and so uh, my uh, decision was made for me, and uh, I accepted the position at Osler. And one of the people I had to write to to say I was not going to the firm was Arthur Patillo, who is also a distinguished graduate of this school. And uh, he wrote back, and he said, somebody sold you a pup. <laughs> and I showed that to Purdy. He was not amused. Uh, <laughs> 
I always wondered why Purdy joined Oser Hoskin, and uh, I have with me a copy of Purdy's biography. It's just published by Gordon Pitts. It's a wonderful read, uh, and it talks about his uh, humble beginnings and his willingness to take on uh, the Toronto establishment and uh, enter a firm like Oser Hoskin, which was the paradigm of an establishment uh, upper Canadian law firm. And he went in. And to the credit of the partners at Osler and obviously to Purdy, um, he succeeded in transforming that firm to be the powerhouse that it is today, shedding its establishment roots and, uh, and really uh, becoming a very commercial, successful commercial enterprise. But I'll tell you what the, the, the environment was like when I articled, um, just to give you a sense what an upper... <coughs> Canadian establishment firm was like. Uh, the senior partner was a man named Harold Charles Featherston Mockridge QC. Um, <laughs> he wore chalk stripe suits and with a vest. Uh, he always had a cigarette dangling, but he was a brilliant corporate lawyer, uh, educated at Princeton and returning to Canada, a very imposing figure. and. Uh, he sat on the boards of some of Canada's major corporations, uh, Montreal Trust, Bank of Montreal. And I was in his office about noon hour one day, and uh, he looked over and he said, Peter, time for lunch. <laughs> and okay, we'll go to my club. And so I walked with him and we went over to the venerable Toronto Club. And uh, we went in and he directed me to the lounge and we sat down. And he ordered a double martini, and not being used to drinking at noon, I, I said, okay, I'll order a beer. So I ordered a beer and uh, sort of worked my way through the, the process. And uh, finally, I, he's finished his martini, and I'm finished my beer, and I'm thinking, okay, it's time for lunch. And he looks over at me, and he said, Peter, you can't fly on one wing. And so... <laughs> I had to have another beer, <laughs> and uh, it was just, it was a very different era. <laughs> you know, I happen to now be a member of the Toronto Club, and if somebody orders a glass of wine at lunch, it's an event. <laughs> In 1970, the conglomerate form of business became very popular, and, uh, but it raised issues of securities regulation. So the uh, government set up a committee, um, and uh, Purdy had been working. He, he had developed a profile in, in uh, securities regulation. He'd worked uh, on what was then known as the Kimber Committee, and the Kimber Committee was a very high-powered committee. Purdy was part of the staff, and it laid the groundwork for what is now our system of securities regulation. Um, Purdy, because of this, was asked, you know, how do we staff this study on conglomerates? And he nominated me as research director and David Johnson, our governor general, as the general counsel. And we went on to publish something called the Merger uh, Report. Um, it was an important experience for me. Uh, it, it sort of helped my profile in securities regulation. And, uh, and of course, I became best friends with with David Johnson, who is, uh, as you well know, a, a wonderful Canadian. After that, I went back to Osler, eventually became a partner, and uh, I worked as one of Purdy's sort of fleet of juniors. He, he was so committed to growth, and he was excellent at drawing in work. People wanted to seek his advice. He was known as a wise and a shrewd uh, advisor. Um, but as soon as he got the client in the door and comfortable with the firm and with his juniors, he'd pass it on to the juniors. So it was a great opportunity for me to assume uh, responsibility. In 1983, uh, the government was looking for a chair for the Securities Commission. And uh, again, Purdy was consulted, and he proposed me as chair of the Securities Commission. And... Uh, um, I, it looked like a great opportunity, and uh, I, I had to obviously resign my partnership 
and the compensation, I took a, a, a serious hit to my compensation, <laughs> but I did get a QC in a parking spot. So <laughs> anyway, it was a, a great opportunity to sit with some very uh, experienced financiers and, uh, and, and learn something. But as soon as I got there, I made a decision I regretted. And uh, uh, you're going to sort of, uh, my talk is entitled Hits and Misses. And well, I'll let you judge this. Um, there was a company called Norsen, Northern and Central Natural Gas. And the chairman of the board was Conrad Black. And Conrad was clearly in the crosshairs of the attorney general. Um, Norsen was making an issuer bid. That's where a company goes out, it's got excess cash, wants to uh, consolidate, so it makes an offer to its shareholders to sell their shares back to the company, reducing the capital, hopefully improving its uh, multiples. Um, the disclosure requirement when you make an issuer bid is to disclose all material facts, and at the time, Norsen was thinking secretly of making a bid for another company. And uh, this was not disclosed. Um, so the Attorney General got on this and um, they concluded, they did an investigation, they concluded that they didn't have enough evidence or they didn't have a provision of the criminal law which would uh, enable them to go against Black. They were going against Black and the CEO, a guy named Ed Battle, you'll remember Jim. Um, so they sent it over to the Securities Commission and they said, okay, you guys, you go after him. So then I thought, hmm, this is going to be a controversial uh, process uh, and I should provide some leadership. And so um, I'm going to participate in the process to decide whether or not to proceed against Black and Company. Um, the problem was that my law firm was the advisor to Norsen, and so uh, I thought, can I do this or can I not? And it was one of those, it, it's like, should I write this thank you note? It's one of those cases where if you have to ask yourself the question, you know the answer. Anyway, I went ahead, asked the question, got legal advice that said, um, this is an administrative process, not a judicial process, so you can, you can participate. So, so we uh, concluded that we didn't have enough evidence to proceed against Black, and we um, informed the Attorney General. Well, the Attorney General's staff was outraged, and they took their whole file, gave it to the media. The media then figured out my connection to Norsen, and uh, there was an editorial calling for my resignation in one of the national newspapers. And I, oh shit, my career is over. Um, <laughs> happily at that time, there was an issue about the four pillars of the Canadian financial system, the banks, the securities firms, the insurance companies, the trust companies. And um, happily for me, the Bank of Nova Scotia acquired a small securities firm in Quebec and it just opened up the whole Pandora's box about ownership of other uh, arms of the uh, uh, financial sector by the banks. The banks wanted to own everything. And so all of a sudden my participation in the Norsen process was relegated uh, or was displaced by a discussion of the four pillars and I survived. <laughs> But it was, you know, I mean, the learning from that is when you have to ask a question about your participation in a process involving principles or ethics, you know the answer. Um, the consolidation of the four pillars has is, is sort of affected me. Personally now, I chair a boutique investment bank, Paradigm Capital. It's a, it's a firm of about 70 uh, people. Uh, we have offices in Toronto and Calgary. And we do sales trading, research and investment banking. And uh, every day we do battle with the chartered banks. Um, the chartered banks have balance sheets that they can use to get investment banking business. It's something we don't. 
are not able to do. Um, and therefore, you know, it's sort of the last laugh is on me with the consolidation of the pillars. <laughs> the securities firms now are, in effect, banks. So after my near-death experience at the OSC, I returned to my law firm, and uh, people thought that I knew something about securities law. And uh, so I was engaged by a very controversial firm called Gordon Capital. And Gordon Capital was advising the Canadian Tire Dealers Association. Gordon Capital was controversial because the way you did financings in those days was a company that wanted to go to the capital markets would engage an underwriter and the underwriter would do a draft prospectus and they would take the principles of the company around the markets for a couple of weeks and then they'd come back and say, okay, we think we can sell you know, $50 million of common shares at such and such a price. So it was kind of a, an arduous process. Well, Gordon Capital looked at this and they said, you know what, we know markets. Why don't we, when we see the underwriters out there sort of testing the market, what can we do? We will just go in and scoop it. We'll just go to the issuer and we'll say, we can, we can buy your issue right now for X dollars and probably with a slight haircut from what they might get if they'd gone through the regular process. And you can imagine, from the issuer's point of view, it made sense, certainty, and it's done. Um, you can imagine from the sort of uh, conventional player's point of view, this was uh, not a happy development. And obviously the way uh, the world has evolved, all of the uh, uh, mainline players are now doing bought deals. Anyway, Gordon uh, engaged me and uh, they were advising the Canadian Tire Dealers Association. Uh, Canadian Tire was controlled by the Billis family and there was one class of shares, common shares. The Billises wanted to raise some money and uh, they didn't want to give up control. So the way they did it was they did a, a share reorganization. So if you owned one common share, you got back one common share and five class A non-voting shares. Um, and then what the Billises would do is sell their um, non-voting shares to raise some money. Um, to get that through, the uh, underwriters and advisors said, we've got to have a coattail on the um, Class A shares. So that, and the way the coattail worked was that any third party making a bid for more than 49% of the common shares, in those circumstances, the A's would convert to common thus forcing the bidder to bid for all of the shares. Um, and uh, so that was, that was fine. Um, the Billises were not getting along. There were three siblings. And so it was, became apparent to the Canadian Tire Dealers that the company was going to go into play. Um, so they, and the way Canadian Tire works is uh, there's the corporation that generate, provides all of the equipment and then the dealers own, own their outlets. And so the dealers are very dependent upon the corporation for, you know, financing uh, equipment and that sort of thing. So they, as a defensive measure, said we can't let control of this company fall into uh, strange hands. So they talked to us. I, I was uh, actively involved in advising and uh, um, you, the dealers, own 17%. Why don't we make a bid for 49%? Uh, sorry, if I said, I may have misspoke on the coattail. The coattail was if a, a, a somebody bids for a majority of shares, then the coattail is triggered. So we said, uh, make a bid for 49% and uh, the coattail won't be triggered. So we thought this would work. Um, we, we read you know, the law up and down, we read the terms of the shares, and we were satisfied that nothing would be triggered. So we announced uh, the bid, and the Securities Commission, my successor, <laughs> Stanley Beck, uh, called me and said, this is abusive. This is abusive of the capital markets. This is abusive of the Class A shareholders. We're going to cease trading. Done. So I said, look, 
you, you know, read the terms of the shares, read your policies, you, you can't do this. He said, I have a public interest power. When I see something that I think is offensive, I can shut it down, and I'm shutting it down. So you can imagine, uh, this was a very large transaction. Um, and uh, from the billist point of view, they were going to realize a huge premium um, <coughs> because we had structured it so that uh, with what they would be paid for the, co the common shares, the 49%, we reverse engineered so that what they got there plus what they would realize when they dumped their A's and remaining commons into the market gave them the price they wanted overall. Um, we went to court, we went to the divisional court and said, uh, you know, you can't, you can't uh, regulate capital markets this way. People can't enter into transactions where it's black and white clear and you have a discretion to go in and upset it. Um, anyway, the court deferred to the experts and uh, said we're not going to interfere. Uh, we're not going to interfere with the exercise of discretion by the Securities Commission. I've been asked by my wife, who is a retired corporate lawyer and is happily here today, what would you have done if you'd been chair of the Securities Commission? Um, always ask zingers. Um, and I, I thought. You know, I think I probably would have, uh, and, and this is a different era now, I think I would have said, look, you guys have the opportunity to anticipate every transaction and capture it in your coattail. So you should have drafted it to pick this sort of uh, situation up, and you didn't, so you're going to have to live and die by the terms of your shares. Um, I probably would have come out on that side. Now that would have been back, that would be today, maybe back in the 80s, uh, it might have been different. What do I learn from that? Uh, and I, you know, I work with with some people who uh, uh, take on very difficult cases or get involved in very difficult transactions. And uh, the learning is always do the right thing when you when you're involved in a transaction and you've structured it and you've looked at all the law and you're you're satisfied that it works. Just sit back and say, you know. Are we doing the right thing here? And you may not change anything, but it's, it should be part of your, your process. So you're probably wondering about my hits and misses at this point in time. My average is kind of uh, paltry. Um, <laughs> so I want to talk about something that was one of the most innovative things that I ever uh, got involved in. It was the introduction of the uh, poison pill into Canadian M&A environment. And this was in 19, uh, 1988. Um, Inco was one of Oser's largest clients. And uh, Morgan Stanley, the global investment bank, went to Inco and said, hey, we've got this really interesting shareholder value creation strategy. Um, you should pay a special dividend of $10 per share. You know, it involves some leverage, but the company nickel prices were high at the time. There was a lot of cash. Pay a special dividend. Our only concern is that you will be uh, in a weakened financial state um, and there will be a very high volume of trading in your security. So we need to ensure your defenses are in order. And we are proposing that you adopt, be the first Canadian company to adopt a poison pill. The poison pill was developed on Wall Street by a man named Marty Lipton of Wachtell Lipton. And he is sort of the defense bar uh, in, in, in Wall Street. And the way the poison pill works um, is it, it's in, in effect a warrant indenture. And the warrant indenture is executed by a trustee on behalf of all shareholders. And in the event a third party acquires more than a threshold, usually 20%, there's what's called a flip-in event. And all shareholders other than this third party can buy um, common shares from the company for a fraction of a penny, the effect being to dilute the acquirer out of existence. So you, any bidder has to address 
uh, if there's a poison pill in place in the target, you have to ad uh, address it. Um, so uh, the OSC, there was a lot of controversy about poison pills, the concern being that target boards of directors would use them to entrench themselves and, in effect, just say no to anybody. So the uh, Securities Commission said, you have to have a shareholder uh, vote. You need to get shareholder approval. And uh, we said, that, uh, that's, that's OK, but you know, we're going to take it to the shareholders as a package. You won't get uh, your $10 unless you vote for the shareholder rights plan. Um, the Securities Commission must have been asleep. Uh, anyway, they allowed us to go ahead, and of course, we got overwhelming support. Um, and then the Securities Commission came up with a policy saying, you know, basically, you can't bribe shareholders with their own money. <laughs> but I, I can tell you, in, in my experience, it was one of the most interesting sort of uh, involvements uh, I had in, in, in my career. Uh, shareholder rights plans are still prevalent in the Canadian capital markets. Our Canadian securities administrators have tried to come up with it's, it. One of the things that offends me so much about our system of securities regulation is how securities regulators put themselves in the position of the shareholder when the shareholders have the resources and the rights to challenge uh, corporate boards. And the securities regulators run around, and so now they've come up with a draft policy saying every bid must be open for four months. And I'm saying corporations are complex. Um, boards of directors have a responsibility that go beyond shareholders. They have to think about the communities in which they work. They have to think about all of the stakeholders. And you guys sitting in a government office are not in a position to make that judgment. And then you don't have a liability for that judgment. Let the boards do their work. Anyway, I'm, I'm probably losing the debate. It's like I've been heavily involved in the whole say on pay thing, which I could give another speech on. It just drives me nuts, nuts that shareholders uh, are getting involved in voting on the compensation. But that's another day. Um, in the course of working on the Inco Poison Pill, I got to know the guys at Morgan Stanley and, and the power of that franchise. And uh, that led to my next uh, job opportunity. I'll tell you very briefly, one of the most memorable experiences I had was uh, the junk bond market was very active in the, this would have been in, in the uh, late 90s. And uh, uh, we were pitching a company to do a, lead a junk bond offering. Uh, those are high yield, you know, risky debt. And uh, so I thought, OK, uh, this is a very competitive process. I'd better bring up one of our heavy hitters from Wall Street, and we'll go and we'll see the CEO. So the guy came up from Wall Street, and he was a heavy hitter. And we went to see the client. And uh, as soon as we got in there, the client said, you know, I've just talked to one of your competitors, and this is what they're prepared to do for me. They're prepared to lend me money personally so that I can participate. They're prepared to give me priority on all new issue financings. And my friend from New York looked at him and he said, take it, and walked out. <laughs> and and it's it just so clear, when you're out to win business, you, you have to win business based upon the merits of your business. You, you know, it, it's so obvious that you can't buy judgment from people you want to do business with. From there, I went on, and uh, tomorrow, uh, Kim and I are doing a, uh, a, a, a seminar on, on corporate governance, and I hope uh, many of you will attend. Uh, it's a whole different sort of aspect of, of my life, so I'm not going to talk about it um, today. Um, I, I'm going to pass through, I, I went on the board of uh, CP Ships, uh, Canadian Pacific, um, back in about 94 was doing a split up. They had uh, four lines of business. One was container shipping. And I went on that board. And um, we got embroiled with the OSC. And it was really about a board's obligation to um, disclose. When, when 
Management comes to you and says, we've got to restate our financials. First of all, you, <laughs> you take a deep breath. Um, and what <laughs> happened there was management knew in June that they had to restate, but they didn't tell us uh, that they were facing a restatement on, on restatement until August. And so the OSC said, that doesn't work for us. And we're going to investigate, see what monkey business is going on. So we went back at the OSC and said, trust us. We are just as in concerned as you are. We're going to do our own investigation. We've got all the resources, all the power, and the independence to do it. And uh, we did that, and the OSC bought our process. Uh, they uh, slapped our wrists, but uh, I think we ducked a bullet. Okay, my final hit or miss, but uh, I regard this as a hit. Um, this, uh, for, I'm going to tell you about Gold Corp. Um, Gold Corp currently is, by market capitalization, the largest gold company in the world. Uh, it's got a market cap of about $20 billion, even though it generates only about 2.6 million ounces of gold a year compared to, say, a company like Barrick which is uh, generating more than twice that number of ounces. Um, in its current form, it was the product of a merger between Gold Corp and Wheaton River. And Gold Corp CEO, when it merged, was a guy named Rob McEwen. And uh, Wheaton River CEO uh, was a guy named Ian Telfer. They did the merger, and the board said, OK, how are we going to accommodate these two egos? And they said, uh, uh, McEwen, uh, you be chair of the board, executive chair, and Telfer, you become CEO. Well, McEwen is a guy that is a hands-on guy, and he said, this doesn't work for me, and he resigned immediately. So then fast forward to 2006. The merger uh, happened in 2004. 2006, there's a tradition on Bay Street that every Thursday afternoon uh, the brokers and bankers disappear to one of the watering holes on Bay Street, usually by Mark, and they go and they swap lies. And uh, I went over there on a Thursday in June of 2006 and I ran into Telfer, who, who I knew from previous dealings, you know, what are you doing? And, and I said, yeah, you know, I'm uh, at a security firm and um, he said, what are the current issues of governance? And I, we talked, and he, I said, do you have any issues of governance? And he said, yeah. Um, he said, call, and he gave me the name of the chair of the board, so I phoned the chair of the board. Anyway, the call turned out to be an interview to see whether I, they wanted me to join the board. And uh, I was invited to join the board. I'm uh, very happy about that. I still sit on that board. At my first meeting in June of 2006, Telfer, who had uh, a larger than life reputation as somebody who creates values doing deals, um, said, I'm thinking about doing a major deal. And uh, OK, point made. And then uh, about a month later, the board reconvened. And he said, uh, we're going after Glamis Gold. And we are going to have a negotiated deal. And it's going to be all paper, all shares. and." Um, to do it, we will have to issue the equivalent of about 60% of our issued and outstanding shares. So that's a big, big chunk of equity. The issue facing, there was no legal requirement for us to get a shareholder vote, a vote of our own shareholders to issue that much <coughs> equity. But there was a, a, a group on the board that said, we need to get, have our shareholders approve this. And I took, uh, the conservative view. I said, there's no legal requirement. We have the responsibility to make these decisions. Uh, we've got direct access to advisors. Uh, we should stand up and be counted. And uh, so my view prevailed. Um, McEwen, who you will recall resigned, was our largest shareholder and <coughs> a mischievous little guy. Um, he initiated a lawsuit to try and uh, force a shareholder vote. And, uh, and we thought, you know what, he's doing this because he wants to inject in uncertainty into the deal. And if you inject uncertainty, then w maybe we'll be in play. And that'll you know, increase the value of his holdings. Um, 
He sued, and the legal process involved exchanging affidavits. I was asked to take the affidavit for uh, Goldcorp. The lawyer for McEwen is an infamous guy named Joe Groya, and Joe Groya is infamous. He's a very aggressive, talented uh, uh, litigator that focuses on Bay Street. Indeed, he represented John Felderhoff, who was one of the people associated with the biggest uh, uh, scam of all times in our capital markets, Briex Gold. And indeed, uh, Joe was so aggressive in the way he dealt with the Ontario Securities Commission, which was his counterparty in that, that his license uh, was suspended uh, for two months by the Law Society of Upper Canada. Now, that suspension is under appeal. Anyway, so I, I had to learn something about the gold business quickly. So I went to Vancouver, spent a night with Telfer. He educated me. I flew back. Everybody was busy, so they said, uh, um, the cross-examination is going to be 8. I had dinner on the Monday night. The cross-examination was 8 p.m. on Tuesday night. And the cross-examination went from 8 p.m. until 2.40 in the morning. And um, Groya pulled every trick in the book to try and sort of expose me. He looked at old speeches and papers I'd written, trying to show that I was inconsistent in the way I regarded shareholders. Um, uh, anyway, uh, half, we got to court and, uh, and, uh, and we prevailed uh, happily. Um, uh, and I flatter myself um, more than I have already, but um, I, uh, my law firm, Osler Hoskin, was acting for Glamis, which was the counterparty to uh, Goldcorp. And they came up to me after and they said, Peter, your career peaked tonight. You used your experience as a lawyer, a securities regular, a, an investment banker, a, and they all came together and, and you were able to confound uh, Agroya. So I, I, I don't know how you think about it. I think, thought of it as a, a hit. Um, allowed me to develop some sympathy for litigation lawyers, uh, how quickly, how fast uh, litigation lawyers have to get up to speed on, on issues because they usually end up, not that I knew that much about the precious metals business, but you have to get up to speed quickly uh, and, and uh, it, uh, it, it, anyway, it, it's a challenge for them. At the time of the merger, uh, people were saying Gold Corp's going to be the third largest gold company in the world because of this merger. Today we're number one. So it was a good deal. Let me conclude by saying uh, I have some very positive reflections upon my uh, legal education here. I felt it gave me uh, the confidence and the tools to move outside my comfort zone, which I did on a number of occasions. Um, and, and take on new challenges. Some, some I was good at and some I was not so good at. But uh, I, I'm, I'm so grateful for the education I got here. It also gave me the ability to think uh, critically. Um, and I think you will all agree that the ability to think critically is the foundation of a civil society. And, it, and, and that's why the law is so, so basic to our quality of life. As my wife said to me this morning, you know, the legal education enables you, you will read the newspaper differently after you uh, have your legal education. It also impressed upon me, and I, I mean, I'm still learning uh, how, what it's like to be a professional and to have obligations that, that you know, transcend just the selfish interests uh, that you may be associated with. It teaches you to deal with sensitive uh, situations, manage sensitive information in a you know, confidential way. I had the benefit of having Purdy Crawford as my uh, mentor, and uh, it's the, the book per, uh, Fire in the Belly uh, it, it's, is the biography of Purdy. It's written by Gordon Pitts, and Kim tells me that the author uh, is, is coming down to address the law school. But I had that good fortune to be one of his juniors. And one of the things he always impressed upon me was to be thinking about public policy and be involved in the debate on the creation of public policy. 
And because he was actively involved, I told you about his involvement in developing our system of securities regulation. If you love language, the law is the place to be. And uh, the ability to take complex concepts and capture them, them in understandable language, I think is a fun exercise and it's an important exercise. And finally, I have to say uh, through my career, uh, I always tried to make sure I was enjoying what I was doing. And if I, I'd, I wasn't enjoying it, then I would either try to change it or I, I would move on. And, and I have to say, in preparing for this lecture, um, I've had a lot of fun and uh, I've, I've enjoyed it. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm going to sign off by my, my children think I look like Peter Mansbridge, so I'm going to say, <laughs> thanks for watching. <laughs>